I'm recording this video, we have been on the road for just over six weeks, and during that time, we've stayed at 13 different camping spots. That does not include the two times that we've stayed at hotels, so we're on the move quite a bit. We're not staying in one place for very long. And more than half the time, we're either boondocking for free on public land or we're dry camping in developed campgrounds. We have not stayed in a single RV park yet, but that is changing. We actually have some reservations at an RV park here in Stanley, Idaho later this week, so we're gonna give our full review on our first RV park stay. So please subscribe to this channel if you're interested in hearing how we feel about that experience. So I thought I'd put a video together about the types of camping we most commonly do, boondocking and dry camping in developed campgrounds, why we like to camp this way, the pros and cons, how I find these types of campgrounds, how I find boondocking sites, a lot of the questions that we've been hearing from people in the short amount of time that we have been on the road living full time in our renovated travel trailer. Okay, so first I'm gonna talk about developed camp grounds. And what I mean by this is places like state parks, national forests, national parks, county parks. Those are developed campgrounds that have individual numbered sites, usually with a level uh, space for you to pull in with your rig. You typically have things like a picnic table, a fire ring, uh, a pit toilet, or an outhouse, certain amenities like that. But most of the time you will be dry camping in these type of places. And that means no water connections, no sewer hookups. Some of these campgrounds will have a certain number of sites with electrical hookups, but that's not always the case. Second is boondocking, and that just means parking for free on public land. You don't have any amenities, no water hookups, uh, no sewer hookups, no electrical hookups, and any of those other amenities that I mentioned, like a fire ring, a picnic table, bathrooms, nothing like that. It's really just you, whatever you're camping in, and the land. Okay, so why do we like boondocking? That is the question. There are a handful of reasons. Number one is the freedom that it provides, not just for us, but also for our two dogs. It is so nice to be able to just let them run free uh, responsibly, of course. And you just can't do that all the time at a developed campground. There are typically leash requirements in those kind of places. So to be able to let them run, let them play is wonderful. The freedom for us to sort of just park wherever we want to park is great. There's just a lot more freedom when you're boondocking. The second thing we love about it is the scenery. You can find fantastic free places to camp with unbelievable views that you just wouldn't necessarily find in a campground unless you're paying a lot or making reservations really far in advance. So that's awesome. Some of the best views that we've ever had while camping have been while we're boondocking. And the third thing that we love about boondocking is the cost. Uh, you really can't be camping for free, right? So if you're trying to cut back on costs, uh, that is a great route to go. All right, let's talk about the cons. I'm only gonna touch on some of the biggest ones for us. It can be a little bit of a free for all. If you pull up to a boondocking spot, you're not gonna know exactly where to go. Sometimes you have to drive around for a while, the land can be a little rough, and you're just looking for a place that looks like it would be slightly level and a decent place to camp. You often also have some disrespectful neighbors while boondocking. We were just at a beautiful place, uh, everything about it was perfect, but there was a lot of noise. There isn't something like a campground host who's gonna tell them to be quiet. There's no such thing as quiet hours. Uh, so you just have to be able to put up with that. And then you don't have certain amenities like trash. There's no place to throw your trash, so you'll have to store it in your rig or in your truck until you leave and are able to dispose of it properly. And then you don't have amenities like a fire ring or a pit toilet, which can be a little bit of a bummer depending on what your setup is. Some reminders I wanna throw out there with boondocking, it is so important to make sure that you are picking up your trash. These places are usually pack in, pack out, so you cannot leave anything behind. We see it all the time that people leave trash. Please don't do that. Also, just because you can let your pets, your dogs off leash, uh, uh, be responsible. Don't let them just run free with no supervision. We have seen that quite a bit too. Just remember that there is wildlife around and you don't want your dogs disrupting or disturbing that wildlife. And another big thing if you're boondocking is to check for fire restrictions. Because they don't have fire rings at those boondocking places usually, you uh, can't always necessarily build your own campfire. If there are certain fire restrictions in place, they might state that you can only have a campfire inside of a fire ring. 
and so that can be a little bit of a bummer if you're not able to have a fire. And I'll explain how we find boondocking sites in just a bit. But I want to talk about why we like staying in developed campgrounds and dry camping in these places as well. So number one, you know what you're getting when you show up there. You know you're going to have a level spot to park your rig, which is wonderful. You're not driving around searching for something that looks like it would accommodate your specific rig. Number two, campgrounds like this are monitored by a host. So you have somebody enforcing the rules. I guess you could look at that as a con too, but it helps uh, mitigate some of those issues like noisy neighbors, people letting their pets run wild, people leaving trash. There's a host there making sure that that kind of stuff doesn't happen. Number three are some of the perks that I mentioned, like having the fire ring, having the picnic table, having the pit toilet even, even though we have a bathroom in our camper, um, having the pit toilets, the outhouses, it does help us a little bit in terms of going a little bit longer without having to empty our black tank if we're able to use the bathrooms that are on site. And number four is it is a relatively low cost to stay in these type of dry camping campgrounds usually 20 to 25 dollars per night we have stayed in some state parks that were a little more expensive than that but the uh the site that we're at right now i believe was 20 dollars per night it's wonderful it's uh, just outside of stanley idaho so you can stay in some really nice areas for relatively cheap something that i was really curious about before we started living full-time in the rv was how long can you camp like this how long can you boondock or dry camp and this will vary greatly depending on the size of your rig, how many people are in your party, is it just you, is it two people, is it a whole family trying to do this? So for us, we can comfortably dry camp for about five days and that depends entirely on weather and our water usage. So I'll talk about our water usage and our tanks first. We typically have to dump our black and gray water tanks after about five days. We could go a little bit longer if we were really careful about water usage, but that seems to be about the sweet spot for us. And that's also usually when our freshwater tank starts to get low. So our freshwater tank, that's what we're using for everything from showers, brushing our teeth, drinking water, doing dishes, uh, giving the dogs water. So that's why we go through that relatively quickly. Okay, now let's talk about power. We have a fantastic solar setup that Cole put in pretty much entirely by himself that allows us to boondock or dry camp for really as long as we want when it comes to power, as long as we have sun. With our setup, we have four 100 watt solar panels on our roof. We also have two 100 amp hour lithium batteries. Those are under our bed. And we also have a 2000 watt inverter charger. With this type of setup, we can run pretty much anything inside of the camper except for our air conditioning because it just draws too much power. It would drain our batteries faster than our solar setup would be able to charge those batteries, if that makes sense. I'm sure I'm not explaining this in technical terms at all, but that's why we can't use our air conditioning. Maybe we could use it for like a second and that would be it. We can use everything else, uh, laptops, phone chargers, uh, I've used my hair dryer a handful of times. We can run the blender, our water pump. So that's fantastic. This type of setup has really been essential to the way that we have been doing full-time RV life so far. Cole works a remote eight to five from the camper. So he needs power all day long to be able to charge his laptop, to be able to power our Wi-Fi hotspot. I also use it every single day to upload YouTube videos and upload content to other platforms as well. So making sure that we have good power all day long is critical and our solar setup has been phenomenal. Now let's talk about how we figure out where to stay. And yes, I will talk about how we make sure we have cell signal and internet connection. Cause I know that's something that a lot of people wonder about is how do you make sure you're able to connect to the internet when you're staying in these beautiful sort of remote places. But first I want to talk about logistics. I have learned that it is not necessarily wise to plan too far in advance. Where are you staying two weeks from now? And I don't know. We have a general route planned out. So we know sort of the area that we're going to be in, but I don't want to make a reservation too far in advance because we have learned already in the short time that we have been on the road that plans change often and you want to have that flexibility. At least we want to have that flexibility, especially since we're moving all the time. We don't want to commit to something too far in advance. So sometimes we don't know where exactly we're staying until the day of. I typically have two to three options picked out 
in the region that we're going to beforehand. That way, if we show up and our first or second choice isn't available, we can go to the third option, whether that is a first come first serve campground or if it's a boondocking spot. Now let's talk about how we find sites. I rely heavily on apps to do this. Campendium is my favorite one. I have been using it long before we started doing full-time RV life. I used it way back when we were just car camping and tent camping. Campendium's paid membership allows you to actually filter sites by cell signal, and that's how I'm able to check for places that I know are going to have a strong enough signal for our Wi-Fi mobile hotspot to work and give Cole the internet access that he needs to do his job. Again, that is a paid membership. It has been totally worth it for us. Campendium also has other filters that you can put on if you just wanna see free spots in the area that you're going to. If you wanna search for something that you know is gonna accommodate your rig, you can search by the length of your RV. You can search for places that allow pets. You can search by elevation. There are a lot of different options and I just find it's really user-friendly. There are a lot of great reviews. They have a lot of users who have uh, taken the time to put reviews on there. I always try to take the time to put our reviews on there to help other people out there as well. I also use Campendium to find dump stations. Uh, you can filter just for dump stations and look for those so when we're boondocking I can find a dump station that's close by that we can go empty our tanks at once they are full. Another great option that I use frequently is the DIRT, and that's spelled with a Y, D-Y-R-T. It's very similar to Campendium. I also uh, pay for the membership, the pro membership for the DIRT, and it has a lot of the same features that I mentioned with Campendium. I can search for places with cell signal on there, so I usually maybe start with Campendium, and then if I'm not finding anything that's really jumping out at me, I'll go over to the DIRT, see if they have any other options, because sometimes that is the case, or sometimes I'll just go look on the dirt uh, to see if there are any more reviews. Maybe I found a spot on Campendium that only has one review and the dirt at that same spot has three reviews. So I use both of those sort of interchangeably, but I would say usually start at Campendium and then go to the dirt. Also fantastic filters and a really great resource. A couple other options I want to mention, freecampsites.net. Yes, it sounds like it's from 1999. I have also been using this one long before we started doing RV travel, uh, when we first started car camping and boondocking. Uh, it's a little more basic than Campendium and the Dirt. It doesn't have quite as many features, but I mean, it gets, gets the job done. You can search for free sites on there. Um, it's a really good option, especially if you're looking specifically for boondocking spots. Two other options that I have looked at but really haven't used much, All Stays and Boondockers Welcome. We do have memberships for those two as well. One thing I make sure I do if I find a site on any of these apps is I try to do my own independent research. After I find a site, I'll just go to Google, type in this place. If it is a, a developed campground like this, I'll check the U.S. Forest Service website because that gives me a little bit more information. You know, do I need to have a reservation? Are there a certain number of sites that are first come, first serve? A certain number of sites that are reservation only? And just check it out at least on another platform if you can, just so you have all the information that you need before you show up. Another thing that I like to do is I check Verizon's cell coverage map because even though some of these apps do filter spots by cell coverage, they're not always entirely accurate. So I like to have a second source to know, okay, we should be okay on cell signal. There is so much more to RV life than I ever could have imagined. We're learning new stuff every day. I'm sure there are some other fantastic resources out there to find really great camping spots. I'm excited to dabble a little bit in the RV park world. That's something that is brand new to us. So please comment below if you have any other resources that you think we need to know about uh, as we continue on this journey, or if you just have any other general RV questions, I would love to hear them. Please don't forget to subscribe to this channel and something I want to mention, we now have links below in the description box to all of our RV essentials. A lot of them are great for boondocking or if you're staying in a developed campground, you can find all of that below. It really helps out to support our channel. So please consider shopping through those Amazon links. Thank you so much for watching this video and we'll see you in the next one.